This paper is an experiment, one that I'm uh, somewhat timid of offering next to my distinguished colleague in English, as I'm trying here to write a piece of theology through a poem. Um, if McCarthy and the poets don't insist to us that there's no separation between word and image, I don't know what does. Um, and the power of such words, oh, it works things, doesn't it? I don't know if the road is, should even be allowed. It's so, it's so much. Um, my title uh, this afternoon is Witnessing in Freedom, Resisting Commodification of the Image. And I hope to offer some hope um, as we think about what it means uh, to testify to God's love and goodness and truth and beauty in the world. So, while Walt Whitman wasn't a self-conscious friend of Christian orthodoxy, I've nonetheless wondered whether there weren't some things that he got right precisely because they were so deeply Christian. That is, he might not have seen them at all, were they not part of the lingering fumes of Christendom that are at least as American as Walt Whitman himself. Perhaps, though, the poet prophet wouldn't have let himself speak these things if he knew how coherent with the gospel they were. In any case, I've long been attracted to Whitman's theology of the body, as it, I believe, gets some things right about what it means to be embodied that couldn't be true outside of the bigger truth of incarnation and resurrection. Whitman sings the body electric in a way that tells the truth about the psychosomatic unity of the human being and about the irreducible, enfleshed worth of each and every human being as embodied images of the one who forbids the making of idols. Quote, whether in the form of anything that is on heaven above or that is on the earth beneath or that it is the water under the earth, end of quote from Exodus 20, but nonetheless expects us in the flesh to testify to the character and power of the Lord. And so Whitman, I sing the body electric, the armies of those I love engirth me and I engirth them. They will not let me off till I go with them, respond to them and discorrupt them and charge them full with the charge of the soul. Was it doubted that those who conceal or who corrupt their own bodies conceal themselves? And if those who defile the living are as bad as they who defile the dead? And if the body does not do fully as much as the soul? And if the body were not the soul, what is the soul? The love of the body of man or woman balks account. The body itself balks account. That of the male is perfect. That of the female is perfect. One doesn't need a full technical account of human constitution to recognize, as someone whose hands and feet are supposed to show the living God to the world, that if the body were not the soul, what is the soul? For what it's worth, I do subscribe to some minimal form of dualism, at least in the Thomistic sense. Um, but I think that the body-soul unity is finally the point, as Thomas does. The celebration here of the male and of the female echoes and can only have been arrived at through listening to the echo of the first chapter of Genesis, where God created humankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. There is nothing here of first or last, of more or less, only of the absolute universality of the image, shared in the particularities of male flesh and female flesh, and given the divine blessing of good work to do, to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. Oh, the fish. They're singing to me now. Uh, Whitman, too, celebrates the fruitfulness and dominion that are our work in this world. Only a world in which we have known, even if we have also forgotten, that male and female flesh are very good, could Whitman tremble before the mystery of the human body 
See that it balks account. Name it perfect. And yet, for us, as every bit as much as for Whitman, we live in a world where the irreducible dignity of every human being is denied again and again, denied as human beings are bought and sold as though they were not miracles, but commodities. I'm not going to dwell on the commodification of human beings here. We've thought about it together quite a bit, and I do want to focus more on the good news by which Jesus Christ sets us free from the logic of the market. But we also have to continue to name the problem. And it seems clear that one characteristic of sinners is that we take the fact of embodiment as license to treat other human beings as market goods. I've learned much here from Willie Jennings and from Sean Copeland, among others, who have shown us the deep heretical horrors, deep heretical horrors, in which slavery broke and continues to damage our understanding of the human being. Jennings showing how white colonialism gave us all an inverted, distorted vision of creation that reduced theological anthropology to commodified bodies. And Copeland insisting that we not look away from the suffering bodies of black women under slavery. She wants us to look at the worst people have suffered. And that we reflect on how the body of Jesus of Nazareth and the bodies of black women together lay bare both the human capacity for inhumanity and the divine capacity for love. And Whitman speaks again as poet prophet, leading us into the hell that is the slave market. I don't think I put this on the slide, no. A man's body at auction, for before the war, I often go to the slave mart and watch the sale. I help the auctioneer. The Slavin does not half know his business. Gentlemen, look on this in wonder. Whatever the bids of the bidders, they cannot be high enough for it. For it, the globe lay preparing quintillions of years without one animal or plant. For it, the revolving cycles truly and steadily rolled. In this head, the all-baffling brain, in it and below it, the makings of heroes. Examine these limbs, red, black, or white. They are cunning in tendon and nerve. They shall be stripped that you may see them. Exquisite senses, life-lit eyes, pluck and volition, flakes of breast muscle, pliant backbone and neck, flesh not flabby, good-sized arms and legs, and wonders within there yet. Within there runs blood, the same old blood, the same red running blood. There swells and jets a heart. There all passions, desires, reachings, aspirations. Do you think they are not there because they are not expressed in parlors and lecture rooms? This is not only one man. This is the father of those who shall be fathers in their turns. In him, the start of populous states and rich republics. Of him, countless immortal lives with countless embodiments and enjoyments. How do you know who shall come from the offspring of his offspring through the centuries? Who might you find you have come from yourself if you could trace back through the centuries? Here, Whitman, in a catena of fleshly particularity, makes it clear that for a man's body to be at auction is incompatible with the wonder of the human being. And again, Whitman speaks about the particularity of male and female flesh, evoking the good embodied work of fruitfulness and dominion. Back to the poem, a woman's body at auction. She too is not only herself. She is the teeming mother of mothers. She is the bearer of them that shall grow and be mates to the mothers. Have you ever loved the body of a woman? Have you ever loved the body of a man? Do you not see that these are exactly the same to all in all nations and times all over the earth? If anything is sacred, the human body is sacred. And the glory and sweet of a man is the token of manhood untainted. And in man or woman, 
A clean, strong, firm fibered body is more beautiful than the most beautiful face. Have you seen the fool that corrupted his own live body? Or the fool that corrupted her own live body? For they do not conceal themselves and cannot conceal themselves. Slavery, we know, is not a thing of the past. The brutal facts of race slavery in this country continue to shape the way we see bodies in the present. Slavery is also not a thing of the past in as much as we live today in a world in which human trafficking flourishes. Numbers that must be dug out of a shadowed world of crime are difficult to ascertain, but there is no doubt that huge numbers of image bearers are bought and sold in our world today. A 2004 approximation suggested some 600 to 800,000 people as victims of trafficking worldwide. 80% female, 50% minors, 70% trafficked for sexual exploitation. Horrifying in their immensity, those numbers are probably much too low. A 2006 estimate from the International Labor Organization suggests there are 12.3 million people in slavery worldwide. It seems clear, a sinful world is a world in which human trafficking flourishes, facilitated by many factors, including large numbers of people migrating, economic and geographic disparities, and globalization. Those who would turn image bearers into market goods are encouraged by, this is research from a, a social, so a political scientist named Shelley, uh, low startup costs, low startup costs, minimal risks, high profits, and God help us, large demand. For organized crime groups, human beings have one added advantage over drugs, they can be sold repeatedly. And the crime of trafficking is fed by our failures to dignify all flesh as human flesh, all human beings as image bearers. Gender as a risk factor in being trafficked is just one example. As the greatest likelihood of trafficking occurs where girls and women are denied property rights, access to education, economic rights, and participation in the political process. Wherever we make somebody less than fully human, they're at risk. And what was true of the past is true of the present. In Copeland's words, since the radical and expedient subjugation of a people to demonized difference in the 15th century, all human bodies have been caught up in a near totalizing web of body commerce, body exchange, body value. When sinners target some people for exploitation and commodification, no people escape the logic that would turn human beings into commodities. The defiling of the human being that happens in the slave market is of the same logic, though obviously different as well, as the defiling of the human being that would take every body, including the most privileged bodies, and treat it as a commodity to, pre to be prepared for sale to the highest bidder. There are endless ways in which bodies can be turned into commodities. Thongs and push-up bras are marketed to seven-year-old girls. The global slave trade and sex slaves is big business. Pornography so saturates the internet that stumbling upon it has become an inevitable part of the life cycle. My students have taught me this, that I need to say to my young children, someday you'll accidentally see porn. Here's what it is, tell me when it happens. There's no avoiding it anymore. The advertising industry uses sex to sell, of course, almost everything, cars, beer, clothes, technology, all are marketed with the message that to buy the product is access to sex. It's all prostitution. Sex is used in currency, as currency in relationships, wherever one partner withholds or offers sex to get what she or he wants. Happily, happily, the Christian theological tradition has plenty to say about what it means to be human about markets for bodies, and about the market more generally. As Steve Long has reminded us, quote, faith and economic matters are inextricably linked. Long knows, though, that to maintain that link requires from us courage, what he calls considerable theological effort because it works against the historical development of modern economics. We're not supposed to question things like low startup costs, right? It's not theological, it's just real. 
My thesis is that the doctrine of the human being in the image of God undoes the commodification of human bodies, and that by living in the freedom that, it are, that is ours in Christ, we can testify, bear witness, to the goodness of a God to whom all human bodies are sacred. I don't know precisely what the imago consists in or of, but I do know that the point of it is to bear witness, to be faithful images of the God of love, images that can be touched and seen. Imago Dei calls us to show and tell. And resisting the reduction of persons to commodities is, I think, one of the most important calls for us to witness in this time and this place. So now I'm going to move into just a brief section in how I see the concept of Imago uh, inherently resisting this commodification. The current reality in which bodies are put on the market is a demonic inversion of the universality and particularity inherent in the doctrine of the imago. Where the radical inclusivity of imago resists commodification, testifying that every human is human, and so universally no human should be bought or sold, the insistent press of commodification wants to include all bodies on the market, wants every body to be for sale. Where the respect for particularity of the imago treasures the fact that fleshly difference is God's good creature and protects and values the particularity of each human being, the logic of commodification uses particularity and diversity as a market tool. It makes particularity into something that makes some people easier to sell. We've seen the universality of the imago. So much depends on the fact that all humankind is created in the image of God, that imago includes both maleness and femaleness, that it is not just the king or the lords who are imago, but everyone. The same Lord who longs for all without exception to come to repentance created all without exception in the divine image. And so universality is a clear link between creation and consummation, between theological anthropology and soteriology. I don't have time to develop that point right now, but I think it's very important to make. We need transformation here, right? the transformation of the converting power of Christ um, to begin to think differently about this stuff. The Lord, Peter assures us, is not slow about his promise, as slow some think of slowness, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. The universality of image bearing demands the universal dignity of the human being. We sinners who would exclude some from the dignity and protection that is theirs as image bearers are not excluded from the gospel healing that allows us to resist the commodification of human beings. Speaking of this universality, Charles Wesley insists that we're all invited right, to the gospel feast. Let every soul be Jesus' guest. Ye need not one be left behind, for God hath bid all humankind. I don't normally recommend trying to make contentious theological points in hymnody, um, but in this particular case, it succeeds. Take that, George Whitfield, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> really? Just some of you out there in back? And yet, the Wesleys and Whitfield remain friends, right? Friends. The universality of creation in the divine image is matched by the universality of the offer of salvation. The divine desire is for all of us. The fact that we are embodied images also demands that we celebrate the particularity of the imago in real, historical, diverse flesh. Though imago is universally the truth about human beings, imago is not instantiated in some generic version of the human being, but in particular bodies. Dan Harmon's comedy series, Community, any fans of Community? Yeah, a few, okay. Uh, pokes fun at the idea of such a generic human being when the students at the show's community college create as their new mascot, the Greendale human being. <laughs> the dean pontificates. Our symbol needs to reflect the diversity of our school and of our species. 
We are the Greendale human beings. We are developing the perfect mascot. No stereotypical identifiers of race or gender, an ethnically neutral mascot. Uh, this creepy guy, of course, is a hilarious disaster uh, because to strip the human being of particulars is to strip her of her humanness. She can't even talk, he can't even talk, it can't even talk in its too tight unitard. Uh, <laughs> but somehow still manages to be white anyway. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> Universally, the image of God is embodied in the particularities of diverse flesh. And so universally and universality and particularity, I'm arguing, um, uh, though the market tries to make them, market categories resist that um, by their own nature. The nature of the imago is both universal and particular means that the concept of imago contains built-in resistance to the commodification of human bodies. And we all, universally and particularly, are called to witness to that resistance by rejoicing in the freedom of our bodies from the market and by protesting rebelling where that liberty is denied. In the next section of the paper, I'm gonna talk just briefly about the Bible's use of market metaphors. Not, I can't do that exhaustively, but just a few examples. Uh, scripture teaches us that human beings are persons and not market goods, and does so through direct and indirect critique of markets for human beings. But also, and this is interesting, through claiming and so subverting market metaphors, in a way that makes our freedom from the market clear. Several examples. First, just quickly from Amos, a prophet of the Imago Dei, when he denounces those who would buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. In Old Testament law, resistance to the idea that human beings can be bought and sold. Though slavery is the economic safety net of the ancient world, Hebrew law, nonetheless, includes the unique, unique among Israel's neighbors injunction that a member of the family can never fully be a slave. As Dr. McDowell has shown us, once we realize that the universality of the imago implies the universality of human kinship, then this law teaches us that it will, it's intended to protect a fellow Israelite, but it teaches us that becoming a commodity must, that resisting becoming a commodity must be extended to apply to all human beings. In matters that Israel alone in the ancient Near East was prohibited from reducing another Israelite to full slave status, in Leviticus 25. Right? If any of you, do I have this up here? I do. If any of you are dependent, if any who are dependent on you become so impoverished that they sell themselves to you, you shall not make them serve as slaves. They shall remain with you as hired or bound laborers. They shall serve with you until the year of the Jubilee. Then they and their children with them shall be free from your authority. They shall go back to their own family and return to their ancestral property. For they are my servants, whom I brought out of the land of Egypt. And they shall not be sold as slaves are sold. You shall not rule over them with harshness, but shall fear your God. Another recurring theme in the Old Testament's treatment of the idea that people could be made slaves um, is the reminder that God has led us out of slavery in Egypt. Moving to the New Testament context, surely we're meant to connect our bodies as temples of the Holy Spirit with Jesus' anger in driving the money changers from the temple. The spirit who makes of our bodies a temple is the spirit of Jesus Christ, who in Matthew 21 entered the temple and drove out all who were selling and buying in the temple, overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves, and said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. This applies not just to the temple temple, but to the temple temples of the Holy Spirit. Right? The temple status of our image-bearing bodies precludes the buying and selling of those bodies. The Jesus who would drive out those dehumanizing buyers and sellers of image bearers is the Jesus who sent us the spirit who indwells us, making it clear that we are not our own, in Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 6. 
And here is where scripture subverts the market for human beings by using the market metaphor to make it clear that there can be no more buying and selling of human beings because we are those who are already bought with a price and therefore free, free to glorify God in the body. By making it clear that human beings have already been bought and paid for, obtained with the blood of God's own son, in the words of Acts, scripture takes us off the market entirely. And taking us off the market, God opens up the possibility that we might become holy witnesses, sanctified and embodiers of the kind of freedom that only comes from Christ. My final example uh, here in this list of uh, biblical examples comes from 1 Peter. And I don't have time to talk about this as much as I want to. I think it meshes very nicely with Dr. Blomberg's paper this morning calling us to the moral image, which is to be holy as God is holy. Um, When bodies are taken off the market because Jesus has already paid for us, um, the result is freedom for holiness. The bulk of my paper then, um, though don't worry, I'm half through, uh, is an example from sexual ethics, uh, an example of a place where I think, at least sometimes, Christians have gotten this right by managing to testify to our freedom from the buying and selling of human beings. We know that Christianity has often failed in our witness, but we have not always failed, praise God. And so I want to develop an extended example of Christian resistance to the commodification of human bodies uh, drawn, as I said, from sexual ethics. In traditional Christian resistance to uh, the New Testament category of porneia, sinful sex, and in contemporary Christian resistance to pornography, we find an embodied outworking of the basic insight that human beings are not commodities. Both the biblical category porneia and the contemporary category pornography take a good created gift, sexuality, and transfer it from the context of personal relationship to the context of the market. Because human beings are image bearers, Christian sexual ethics oppose any sex that is bought and sold. In this, Christian sexual ethics are and always have been profoundly countercultural. I am obsessed with this book by Kyle Harper. Uh, I've learned so much from it in the last year. Uh, From Shame to Sin, the subtitle is The Christian Transformation of Sexual Morality in Late Antiquity. It sounds boring, but it's not. It's fascinating. Harper has helped me to understand the countercultural nature of Christian sexual ethics in the ancient Roman context. An understanding that I believe helps us to see how and why Christian sexual ethics should continue to look countercultural today and so can be a part of the way that we witness to the freedom that is ours in Christ. Harper traces the process in which Christian sexual morality replaced or tried to replace, to some extent successfully replaced, uh, the sexual morality of the ancient Roman Empire. And his analysis reveals that emerging Christian sexual ethics denied the market for bodies in favor of the freedom that is ours in Christ. It's not, of course, contrary to popular caricatures of prudish Christians, it's not that Rome didn't have any sexual ethics and Christians brought some in. Uh, Every culture has sexual ethics. Every culture has a system, a way of policing and legitimizing what kind of sex is good and what kind is bad. In ancient Rome, sexual morality was mostly about the goods of the state. It was also about protecting the manliness of men in power. And the word porneia, that same word used in the New Testament for sexual sin, referred primarily to prostitution, sex that is bought and sold. Porneia is about sex for sale and about the people, men and women, whose business it was to sell it. There were two kinds of women in Rome. Sound familiar? (laughs) Honorable and shameful. There were wives whose bodies were protected and prostitutes whose bodies were available for anyone's use. If you were a woman in the honorable category, sexual morality meant making it absolutely clear that your babies belonged to your husband. So 
Girls were to be virgins when they married and avoid adultery or any appearance thereof after marriage. The sexual honor of women was policed. Ancient women, Harper tells us, lived every moment engaged in a high stakes game of suspicious observation. Husbands controlled wives' bodies and wives were for having babies. Rome needed the babies. In a world where no woman could think of childbirth without fear of death, it was a free woman's job to produce babies for the state. Rome needed citizens and soldiers. If you were a free Roman man, sexual morality was more complicated. Nobody imagined that you needed to be chaste, uh, but you were expected to engage in a certain kind of moderation. <coughs> Pardon me, to show that you were in control. Even then, it was acknowledged that moderation wasn't very likely in the years between puberty and marriage. And male sexual morality meant following rules that made it clear who has the power. Everything I've just said about Roman sexual morality was true if you were a free person, but the whole system depended on the existence of people for whom it couldn't be true, slaves. And Harper's book on sexuality actually uh, is a follow-up to a book he wrote on slavery, uh, and he realized the intimate connections between slavery and, and sex. Right. Harper shows how the sex industry was integral to the moral economy of the classical world. Slaves were everywhere, and that meant that free Roman men had pretty much constant access to sex. That was seen as a social good. It's good for everybody, if that's the case, because it keeps young men from going after other people's wives, and it's cheap, and it keeps things in order, right? Harper tells us, finally the quote there, that commodification of sex was carried out with all the ruthless efficiency of an industrial operation. The unfree body bearing the pressures of insatiable market demand. The wealthy had slaves to serve their needs. Prostitution was the poor man's piece of the slave system. Christian sexual ethics challenged an ancient world in which the sex industry was integral to the moral economy. Christianity's coordinated assault on the extramarital sexual economy marks one of the more consequential revolutions in the history of sex. Christian sexual culture required new conceptions of moral agency. Sexual ethics is tied to freedom, moral agency. And I've lost my place. There we go. Harper argues that a Christian understanding of the human being as a creature with free will grew up largely around sexual morality. Roman sexual morality was simply about class and gender. If you were privileged, morality meant women were chaste and men had unwavering power and control. If you weren't privileged, if you were a slave, being honorable, being moral wasn't an option. If you weren't one of the lucky ones, dishonor was simply your fate. We live in a world in which bodies are turned into commodities, I think, just as relentlessly as they were in Rome, though there may be less protection for so-called honorable women than there used to be. Certainly, sex is still for sale in obvious ways. We've already thought about trafficking, the buying and selling, the porn industry raking in the dollars. Sex also being for sale um, in less obvious ways. I think there's a sense in which our whole culture asks us to be temple prostitutes. Our world wants us to make our bodies about pornea, yeah, selling sex, and the commodification that goes with that. I can buy all these products to make all the bits of my body more marketable, marketable instead of about the Lord. The people who want to sell me the products are happy, I think, about that. And so it turns out that the promise of free sex, which our culture claims to offer, is not so free after all. One of the strangest things about Christian sexual ethics, if you were an ancient Roman, was the idea that we're all free. Our bodies aren't for the state anymore. Our bodies aren't for the big men with the power. They're not for the porn industry or the beauty industry. Our bodies are for the Lord. We're free to witness and to love, free to marry or not marry, 
to have babies or not have babies, because the future of the world depends on Jesus and not on the size of the Roman army. The body is not for Pornea, but for the Lord, 1 Corinthians 6. God redeems what we have forfeited. God makes the broken whole. Christians have thus recognized marriage as the appropriate context for sexual expression because marriage is or ought to be that context in which there is no specter of compulsion, no threat of bodies bought and sold. Because marriage is a covenant context, a context in which co-equal image bearers can offer their bodies to one another, not for a price, but as gift. The Song of Songs, among other things, gives us a biblical portrait of this sort of context, of marriage as a place for delight in the loved one that is possible because of friendship and mutuality. In marriage, delight in the loved one's body should be free, happy, and secure, because in it, the lovers no longer have to grasp after it, trying desperately to meet an unmet need. What if we're set free from such grasping by security in God, by resting in God's faithfulness to us in a way that relativizes human love and so sets that human love free from the economy of sin? We have, we hope, uh, in marriage, that place in which where we can celebrate the sweetness of the Song of Songs, where the loved one's speech is most sweet and he's altogether desirable where we recognize the loved one as beloved and friend. In God's redeeming power, we may enter in marriage into a garden of delights where sex is freely given and freely received, where there is no price on bodies because we know that the price has already been paid in full by Jesus Christ. Those who know that they have been bought with a price set free again to glorify God in the body. When all is grace, we can rest in love, both human and divine. In God's redeeming power, hearts that were captive to sin are loosed from their chains. In God's redeeming power, our very bodies become, tem become temples of God the Holy Spirit. And God gifts us with the power to resist exploitation. God gives us, for instance, the power to relinquish sex that would use the other for our own purposes and to delight only in the spouse who is both beloved and friend. Early Christianity, in rebelling against Roman sexual morality, was bold enough to imagine that all of us have in Christ the freedom to bear witness to who God is. Remember, in Rome, only some people have the freedom to be honorable. Only some people get protection. In the kingdom, everybody's body is honored. In Rome, bodies are for power or pleasure or the state or the market. In the kingdom, bodies are for the Lord. In Rome, sexual ethics are governed by very different rules for men and women. In the kingdom, we're universally called to be chaste. All of our bodies, not for pornea, but for the Lord. In Rome, if you're sexually shameful, there is no going back. In the kingdom, there is forgiveness and healing and grace and freedom. In Rome, either you're a slave or you're free. In the kingdom of God, we are all free. And Christianity had to work this out in a context where, in fact, many Christians were slaves, um, where they might not have choices about what they could or couldn't do with their bodies, but they were recognized to have the moral freedom uh, to be pure in heart and to be devoted to God alone. As a witness to this, I hope, we value singleness and marriage as two routes, two ways of life in which Christians may be truly sexual and truly free. I regret that I don't have time this afternoon to think more about singleness as a way of witnessing to the freedom that is ours in Christ. Um, I, I've worked that out in print in some places, um, but time is limited right now. So we have a Roman Empire in which there was very little sexual freedom, except perhaps for men with privilege and social status. The sexuality of respectable women was carefully controlled, both by families and the state. Slaves had even less freedom, devastatingly vulnerable, in Harper's words. And their marriages had no legal protections. Harper highlights the lack of freedom of ancient Roman women, both slave and free, as he explains 
that female sexual honor was dispensed just as much by the lottery of fate as by the force of the individual's will. What these women and male slaves too wanted was not a question that anyone cared about. Honor, dishonor, citizen versus slave status were not choices someone made. They were imposed from the outside. By understanding all Christians universally as free moral agents who could choose sexual purity, and this, this is right there in the literature, even if they couldn't choose sexual purity because they were being raped because they were slaves, they could still choose in the heart. The early church came to understand that our value, our worth, our purpose in the world can never ever be attached to some supposed status of our bodies as market goods as though we were merchandise instead of sons and daughters of the king. Because sexuality is a sign of God's grace, it can never be commodified. It can't be wrenched out of the framework of free, mutual, consensual relationship and placed on the market floor. And if sex is thus free, then sexual holiness cannot mean having a valuable kind of body or preserving that value against loss as we so often unfortunately teach our young people. But we failed to be clear about that. Um, instead, we brought into a mistaken set of ideas about what purity looks like. We bought into a set of rules that turn people's bodies back into commodities. Those rules are weeds that would choke the garden of delights that is ours in the Song of Songs. Those weeds that would strangle the glorious freedom of consensual mutual covenant relationship in which sex ought to happen. Rules are lies that convince us to prepare our bodies for sale to the highest bidder instead of delighting in our bodies and praying that God might use them as signs of the freedom of grace. Our bodies are not merchandise. We're not valuable items that can be used up or spent uh, once we've had sex, say. Having sex doesn't devalue bodies. The bodies of married, sexually active people are every bit as pure as the bodies of virgins. When we make bodies out to be merchandise, we tend to make female bodies into merchandise in a special way. Male bodies maybe have a chance still of being seen as personal, as the tangible lives of human beings who bear the image of God, but female bodies so often are downgraded, women and girls being treated as property and our bodies placed on the market. This is under the condition of sin the way many, maybe most, people and cultures have treated female bodies, treated us as property. But God's good revelation challenges this again and again. The biblical concept of the imago insists that all humans are human, that all humans are created in the image of God. Scripture is explicit. When God creates humans in the divine image, male and female are included. And scripture dignifies marriage letting us see marriage as about mutual, personal, consensual, covenantal relationship, at least part of the meaning, I think, of the one flesh union of Genesis. Jesus returns us to that context in Genesis and to God's good creative intentions for human beings when some Pharisees come to test him, asking if it's lawful for a man to divorce his wife. Uh, there's a in fight of interpretation going on among the rabbis. What does one have to do to be allowed to, what does a wife have to do to be divorceable? Um, just anything that you don't like or does it have to be something really bad? Uh, and as Jesus is wont to do, uh, he surprises them with his answer. He explains the passage in Deuteronomy which uh, seems to legitimate divorce uh, as a concession to our hardness of heart and asks his hearers to think about God's good intentions for marriage. Then he quotes, or at least riffs on Genesis, from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. The two are no, so they are no longer two, but one flesh. And then he tells his disciples, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. The first part was revolutionary. People assumed adultery was a property crime, right? a crime against a man whose property, his woman, had been messed with. People thought men couldn't commit adultery. It was women's bodies that were property and so could be stolen or damaged. Jesus, by making it clear that men can be adulterers, challenges the whole market economy that would buy and sell bodies, especially women's bodies. 
Adultery isn't a property crime. It's a violation of God's intentions for humanity as image bearers. I need to skip a little bit more here now um, about uh, how men are called to sexual holiness as well as women. Crazy, right? Uh, uh, and conclude uh, with uh, some hopes about witnessing in freedom. We're called to witness against the commodification of the human being when we teach the gospel of grace, and I think when we live out fairly traditional Christian sexual ethics. I hope we can imagine together other ways we can witness to that freedom as well, other ways we can make it clear that our bodies aren't on the market because we've already been bought with a price. We're set free from the logic of the market and have opened up before us the possibility that we might mean something good and true and beautiful by testifying to who God is becoming those who can glorify God in the body. If Walt will forgive me the leap, uh, I want to let another poet speak very briefly, uh, John Donne. To our bodies turn we then that so weak men on love revealed may look. Love's mysteries and souls do grow, but yet the body is his book. The faithful body can be a revelation of the God who is love, telling a story of God whose love is steadfast, of a God who desires his people, who reaches out to us, asking that we reach back in relationship and true mutuality. God gives us grace for Jesus to be made visible in our flesh, our flesh for, for mission, for witness, for giving glory to the God who saves. We're called to embody our freedom from the market and to witness to Christ by living in practice the truth that Christ has set us free by making it clear that our bodies are for the Lord. Theologian John Baer, after calling Jesus the first true human in history, speaks of the way that being set free, speaks of the way in being set free from fear of death by the promise of resurrection, we're free even to die, to be witnesses, martyrs testifying to what Christ has done. In and through Christ, says Bear, we now have the possibility of freely using the givenness of our mortality to be reborn, going down into the waters of baptism and rising up again by choice. So coming to be in a life without end, only now does freedom, not necessity, become the basis for a truly human existence in God. I pass my time. I'll let Walt Whitman have the last word here. Um, as he asks us just to be present to one another in the body. Present not in a market context, but in a personal context. I have perceived that to be with those I like is enough. To stop in company with the rest at evening is enough. To be surrounded by beautiful, curious, breathing, laughing flesh is enough. To pass among them or touch anyone or rest my arm ever so lightly around his or her neck for a moment. What is this then? I do not ask any more delight. I swim in it as a sea. There is something in, saying, in staying close to men and women and looking on them and in the contact and odor of them that pleases the soul well. All things please the soul, but these please the soul well. Oh, my body, I dare not desert you in the likes of other men and women, nor the likes of the parts of you. I believe the likes of you are to stand or fall with the likes of the soul, and that they are the soul. Thank you.